so much panic, pandemonium, commotion. You know, this is March 19th, March 20th, something like that. I'm in school at UPJ and I got so much to do with online. You know, we got through three fourths of the semester and now it's pandemonium because we have all our assignments to do online and it's not an online school, so it's really chaotic. Not to mention the coronavirus outbreaks every day. People are dying, there's chaos, people are losing their jobs stock market's crashing and you know when this comes out who knows if the coronavirus is going to be worse better we're going to forget about it i don't know but what i can tell you is in these crazy times this is right now the best time to just take a break take a breather especially on a night where it's 57 to just open your windows and listen to the sounds of nature listen to the sounds that we've been blessed the opportunity to steward over. I can hear wood frogs right now and spring peepers. And sometimes I think that we just need to be able to use these opportunities as an outlet to get away from our stress, from our anxiety, from our fear, and from all these other things. If we're able to just go out and observe nature, or if we're able to just take time out of our day and relax and and stop thinking about all of the, the pressure and the, the depression and the anxiety and the fear that's in everyday life and just come out here, come out to the woods somewhere or maybe even it's on your property and listen to these frogs and toads that are gracing us with their presence and selecting that area to breed. The air smells fresh, it's such a great smell the wind is kind of blowing, it's a nice cool breeze. The wood frogs, the spring peepers are abundant, they're thriving, they're succeeding. This feels like you're out in the country, this feels out in the woods somewhere. And it doesn't necessarily have to be. We want to make sure that not deep into a forest or woods is where wood frogs and spring peepers are abundant. We want to make sure that this is everywhere that it's possible. They can be suburban animals, they can be urban animals. It just depends on if they're given the chance. And right now, I'll tell you what, all these stores are closing down, all kinds of hobbies you guys might have, they're being halted because of the chaos and the way the world is heading. But what I can tell you is nature, for the most part, isn't going anywhere unless we decide that. Which means these frogs will be here, and they're here right now. So we have the opportunity to use these frogs, and I don't mean use them in an abusive way, but to enjoy them and be in their presence and find relief and to be able to relax. Up in the woods uh, somewhere in Cambria County, but I am just showcasing here How's it going everybody? I am the owner of PA Woods and Forests, which is a brand focused on frog and toad conservation. I'm joined here with one of my pals, my white's tree frog. This is what happens when you get into a hobby that involves noisy animals. Anyway, I am from the brand PA Woods and Forests. I own the website and the rights to the name, the logo, everything. I'm here to talk about my capstone project that I was able to accomplish and I'm going to be breaking down the different aspects of my poster. So I wanted to start by explaining what my capstone project was about. Just as the brand PA Woods and Forests focuses on frogs and toads mostly, that was the area of research that I thought needed the most help in conservation. Getting people excited and interested about frogs and toads is a lacking area and this is one of the reasons why I got involved into the social media aspect of promoting getting people out there, getting people into 
how they can help frogs and toads. So my brand is focused on that and I wanted to use my platforms on different social media networks to be able to impact as many people as I could. So with my research project, I wanted to figure out how social media can impact the conservation of frogs and toads and if it can create even more of an impact than what we have today. If you've checked out my poster, you'll read in the abstract that frogs and toads are facing so many tremendous challenges. Whether it's climate change or it happens to be pollution, deforestation, the chytrid fungus which is destroying them, causing frogs to go extinct in the wild. There are so many different things that are contributing to the demise of frogs and toads. And National Geographic, among other researchers and resources, have estimated that somewhere around 30% of frogs and toads are at risk of going extinct if everything continues the way it is today currently. That's a really scary and alarming number that frogs and toads are continuously battling to stay alive and to not be extinct. And for the most part, we are the reason for that. When you talk about conservation and many things to save the lives of frogs and toads, one of the most important aspects is how we are keeping them alive. The most important aspect that I looked at with this research project is how are we reproducing frogs and toads in captivity and then releasing them back into the wild and how are we promoting that to the public. So in my literature review, the main focus was on how people are reproducing and releasing the offspring of frogs and toads back into the wild. This was the majority of what I spent my research on and my literature review as well speaks for that. Some of the most important points in the literature review I have on my project that you guys have looked at on the PowerPoint project, I'm sure. And I started my project with the literature review talking about the Wyoming toad, the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo with their research as to how long it's taken them since the 1980s up to now to get a really successful program going while they're still facing an uphill battle of trying to reproduce the most endangered frog or toad, amphibian for that matter, in the United States. From the source Burton 1994 with the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, they were starting to run into difficulties when they were field collecting the Wyoming toads and were not able to successfully get them to breed. One method they began to gain some interest in was hibernation. But after they began to take hold of a very good procedure that they did, they started to have more surviving toads, which in turn meant that the toads were reproducing more. Along with the successful hibernation method, they were injecting the toads with hormones that led to an abundance of toads reproducing for the first time in over a 12-year study and conservation program that was put into place between various zoos and the Wyoming state officials. This method is very important because it was one of the first ever reports of hibernation being used as a method to reproduce amphibians in captivity. Looking at hibernation as the key aspect as to why different groups, conservation teams, and zoos want to produce frogs and toads from is because the benefits of it not only save the frog's life, which means they don't die in a quicker span of time, but if there's only a certain amount of frogs or toads in the wild and they're constantly needing to take them, they're quickly going to run into problems with incest and health issues that frogs and toads are going to face with having the same genes reproducing together time and time again and it's going to cause serious issues in the populations. It could also lead to extinction. The San Diego Zoo was very aggressive and they pioneered a method of only hibernating the yellow-legged frog as their method for how they were going to reproduce the specific species and put its offspring back into the wild. Santana from 2015 reports the method as being a success with 6 out of 16 
groups of frogs reproducing. Now they tried different methods. They wanted to see if they hormonally injected the frogs only without hibernation if that would work. That didn't produce much. They wanted to withhold certain frogs from hibernation. That didn't work either. But when they successfully hibernated, brought them back out of hibernation, six out of the 16 in the group, the mountain yellow-legged frogs, successfully reproduced. It's a very aggressive approach because it's not necessarily been the standard and it's not something that most people look at as being highly successful. The San Diego Zoo has created a method that seems to have produced very, very good results. However, simultaneously in the same year, Harding in 2015 reports, after researchers have failed to produce successful and meaningful programs of how they've been taking frogs and toads from the wild and bringing them into laboratories and into captivity, Harding questions the motives of the, the scientists and the research teams that are using the frogs and toads just for education, or they're using them just for research. This was one of the very first sources to really challenge what scientists were doing. He states that there hasn't been very many successful reproduction programs. Towards the end of his paper, he also states that there are certain research programs he knows that might be too young in their reporting and in their findings to release anything credible. This was a very interesting point and it's a challenge to these groups as to how are they going to release their information, not necessarily just over peer-reviewed articles and releasing them to journals and databases, but how else are they releasing them? The other aspect of this whole project was about social media. How is social media being used to impact the different roles that conservation teams are playing? In the same year, in 2015, Langaro, another source, focused on social media as to how it influences the brand's perception on different platforms. Langaro continues to explain how the brand's perception and the way that the message is created and the way it's delivered, the, the words that are used specifically, are very important and they matter. Especially figuring out your audience and who is listening, who is watching. This could be very beneficial to zoos and research teams, how they can take up the challenge of Harding in 2015, who reported that there are very little findings and very little to show for with these research teams. So if they're partnering with zoos, which a lot of these conservation teams seem to be doing more and more as time goes on, this could be a breakthrough in how the public gets involved in working and taking up the cause. This wasn't something that only conservation teams in zoos should look at. Anybody who's involved in pursuing the education and trying to create a call to action and trying to work with any animals, but specifically let's say for frogs and toads, they need to have a platform. Just as the sources in the literature review have stated, platform, creating a brand, and having the right words going to the right audience are very important. I wanted to create a procedure that was going to be very efficient and it was going to be very effective. The first part of my procedure was to create a panel of two experts and myself. There was a goal that was set of hopefully 25 people that we were looking to meet. Not only were we trying to accomplish getting people in seats, but we were also pushing the envelope in creating a social media live event on Facebook. The PA Woods and Forest brand was going to go live with my phone and we were going to actually showcase the panel. So as people were watching it live, others could be watching it on Facebook. And we were also hoping to achieve 25 people. The reason for the low number is because we had a hope that if we set the number at a certain number, if we set the number at a certain level, we could go above that. We could achieve more than that. We were going to talk about the extinction and the crisis that's facing frogs and toads around the world. 
that was going to be the most important part of the panel discussion. And we were going to give educational and really informational pieces about how it matters to us, how it matters to the public, and what we can do with frogs and toads to help them in our own backyards. The PA Woods and Forest brand has a very strong presence on YouTube, and the most important reason for that is a project that is called Frog Week. Frog Week focuses on myself and a team of friends, colleagues, experts, and various people go off into the woods in the forests of Pennsylvania and we find the frogs and toads as well as other things. So it's a conservation and educational week where I'm going out and I'm doing the dirty work all throughout the spring when the frogs and toads are out into the early parts of the summer. It's a weekly episodic series that showcases frogs and toads from around the state. Frog Week has been sponsored by various public Facebook groups as well as international forums and different companies and we're continuously looking to gain support from the state and from other companies that would want to jump on board as well. It's not just about a conference and a panel presentation, but we are also creating a strong media presence on Facebook and Instagram with followers continuing to build as time goes on. We've now reached over a hundred on Facebook and Instagram. So the conference did not happen because of the coronavirus and all the different things that we're facing now currently. There is just no way that it was going to happen. So there's no way to tell truthfully what would have come about with the presentation. But from the procedures that I took, I created a Facebook event, invited a lot of people, and I was going to continuously add information as time went on and also incorporating going live with social media. I believe that it would have been very successful. The very first live video that I produced with the Facebook page got 450 views as soon as I ended the broadcast. That's what it finished with was 450. So it's very possible we could have had even more people tuning in to watch. The discussion for this whole project follows the literature review with the different methods that they were using for trying to bring frogs and toads back from the brink of extinction, as well as trying to secure the abundant species. And they needed to do it in a way that made people care. The hibernation method was a very key feature in this whole project. While there's different methods as to how you can reproduce frogs and toads, I was very interested in showcasing using a natural method how successful it can be and present this as something that can potentially be life-saving to different species that are at risk. In the future, it would be really interesting for somebody to come along and study what effect that zoos have. Are zoos making conservation efforts for frogs and toads easier? Are they making them better? Are they making any difference at all? As well as people studying the reasons why frogs and toads are going endangered and why they're so at risk. Like we mentioned in the beginning, pollution, deforestation, disease, and all kinds of different things that humans bring upon them for the most part. Understanding the social media presence of zoos, understanding the social media presence of different research teams, if they're using them or if they're choosing not to use social media, and if that really matters. So that's gonna do it for the poster and the project presentation. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, this is also a look into what I've been doing as I've been working on Frog Week. I've also been working on a project for school that is an educational and conservation program. And it involves everybody within the PA Woods and Forest community. That's what I call my followers on YouTube we're all the PA Woods and Forest community. People from Russia, people from Greece, people from all kinds of different countries, even different states, doesn't matter. 
I see us all as a community. The findings in this project are already something that we've continued to do with the brand, with Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. The only difference is now getting better at getting the message out across different brands. So you can rest assured that Frog Week is going to be advertised, produced, and designed this year with the perspective of how it can affect different social media platforms and how it can affect people all across the board because we want to create a conservation and educational project that gets the United States hopefully at least to start with Pennsylvania and if not Western Pennsylvania if we could at least make an impact somewhere then the world and the frogs and toads in that place are better off thank you the peak the this is where the action happens last time I was here look you can see the tadpoles are developing you can see Something moved under the water. But... Toad, and we have a spotted salamander. This spotted salamander could be. I truly hope that you will just appreciate frogs and toads more. Thank you guys so much for your time. It is late. I'm going to be heading home here. I will see you guys whenever the pond frogs and the American toads start to breed, which is gonna be very soon.